I want to talk to you this morning about Moses. Moses, this incredible, incredible man in history. Interesting life, dramatic, dramatic changes he went through. Moses was raised in great comfort and privilege. He was raised as a, uh, uh, the son of Pharaoh's daughter in the palace, you know, great, great life for him. When he was a young man, obviously he felt called in his heart to protect, protect his people, the Jews. They were all under brutal slavery. Moses, you know, had this wonderful life of privilege. One day he's going along as a young man and he sees some Egyptian taskmaster being really cruel to some Jews and something rose up in Moses and he went to protect the Jews and got in a fight with the Egyptian and wound up killing him, which I'm sure was not his original intention, but he kills this guy and now, now he's in big trouble. And from this life of great privilege and comfort, Moses now has to run for his life. And he's scattered out to the desert and spends the next 40 years of his life on the backside of the desert, taking, taking care of sheep and camels and whatever critters they have over there. And uh, just uh, a very different life. And suddenly God shows up and appears to Moses, this burning bush, a physical uh, appearing, and, uh, and literally speaks to Moses in an audible voice and tells Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. You're going to lead them to freedom. Well, now Moses is a dramatically different man. Early on, he probably would have said, yeah, let's go. Let's make it happen. Well, after 40 years being on the dark side of the moon, when God came to him and said, I want you to go back, he said, no, no, I don't want to go. I can't go. I'm incapable of going. I've got all kinds of reasons I can't go. A little known fact, if you read the biblical account, at one point, God got so mad he was going to kill Moses. You say, why would God kill Moses? I don't know, but if God appears to you physically and speaks to you in an audible voice and tells you to do something, you better do it. <laughs> All right? So, I mean, you know, obviously this was not going well with him disrespecting God, and God got pretty ticked, but it's all finally passed over. But uh, Moses was a reluctant warrior, to say the least. Uh, this is primarily because of what happens something the Bible warns us about, which is do not let the failures of your past dictate who you are today. And Moses, clearly, this had happened to him. He started out in great promise, great glory, 40 years of thinking of his failure, of hiding because he murdered this man. And when God shows up, he has no confidence anymore. He lets his past dictate who he became. And uh, he was very insecure and finally struck a deal with God. He says, look, I'll go, but I'm not, I'm not saying anything. Okay, I, I, I hate speaking in front of people. You know, I'm no Pastor Mark. You know, I don't like talking in front of people. So God finds, okay, so take Aaron with you. He'll talk for you. So this reluctant warrior goes... And he tells Pharaoh, let my people go. Now, when you watch the movie versions of this, you always see Moses going, let my people go. You know, with the big stick, you know. Let my people go. When in reality, that's Hollywood's version of it. The truth is, Moses never said anything because he was scared to death to talk. <laughs> Moses stood there like this. It was Aaron who goes, he wants you to let the people go. <laughs> and, and Pharaoh's probably thinking, who's the old guy with the stick? Because he never says anything. Because he was scared to death of talking. Aaron did all the talking. Moses stood there with the stick. Well, anyway, God does miracle after miracle at the hands of Moses. And eventually, confidence builds in him. And he leads the people out of Egypt parts the Red Sea, they go across and get to the other side. Life is good. 
a whole nation of slaves all of a sudden turn into a nation of free men and women. So then he goes up into the mountain uh, for 40 days. God speaks to him and gives him his law, starting with the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments were really the first ten. There were tons of commandments that they had to come up with. I mean, the old Jewish law is extremely restrictive. Not a fun thing to do. But uh, the top ten, these are the biggies that he starts with. And he has them on these tablets written by the finger of God. He comes down and the people were already a mess. He was gone for 40. Here they had been in slavery in Egypt for some 400 plus years. Consider the United States of America has only been in existence barely 200 years. Double that as how long these people were stuck in Egypt, subservient positions, and under the last uh, pharaoh, under great hardship, which we'll read about in just a minute. But uh, these people had the same problem that Moses had. They let their past dictate their future. They couldn't understand or relate to being a free people. In fact, the whole time, the Bible says they were out there in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years. The trip from there to the promised land was like a 10-day walk. It took them 40 years. Why? Because they couldn't get used to this idea of being free. They kept longing back for Egypt. They kept wanting. Can you imagine how brutal they had been treated? They whined incessantly. We got to go back. We got to go back to Egypt. We got You brought us out. We're all going to die out here. We got to go back to Egypt because they couldn't let go. The Bible tells us of this in the New Testament and warns us in no uncertain terms. As an analogy to our faith, don't let that happen to you. A lot of times we'll start out walk, walking with God and wanting to do what God wants to do as people of faith and Christians. And yet, make no mistake, there will be this part of you that will want to go back and do the things you did before. Why? There's a certain amount of security and familiarity with the sins of the past. That's why a lot of you, bless your pee-picking hearts, you know, as much as you love God and you come to church, you want to grow in your faith, the minute pressure builds on you, a lot of you resort back to the way you always did life. That's why some of you, as sweet as you are, when you get mad, you curse and have a fit and a cow and all the other stuff and other things that you do. Why? Of course, then you ask God to forgive you, which he'll forgive you. But at some point, we need to move on. Quit going back to that stuff. Because if you let your past dictate your future, you'll never rise past it. You'll stay limited in all of your life. Don't let your failures determine who you are. Hard to do because failures are failures and they seem to burn into our minds and they just roll around in our heads. It can be very discouraging. But we as people of faith need to let it go. If there's anything God is trying to say to us is let it go and move forward. Hard for us to do because we're still trying to wrestle and dealing with these things of the past. And that's what these guys did. Moses is up there for 40 days. They freak when he's up there for 40 days. And they want to go back to Egypt. And they, they don't know what to do. So they build a, a golden calf. And, and they're dancing around a cow. They're worshiping a cow. We're from Wisconsin. You don't worship cows. So there are, you know, there's pagan rituals and stuff. Like Moses comes back and they're dancing. He's, he's furious. Now, uh, in June, I'm going to be going to South Africa. I'll uh, tell you more about it in a couple of weeks. i uh, going to be speaking over there. If I come back and you're all dancing naked around a cow, I'm going to be really mad. <laughs> you know. And, and that's what happens to Moses. He's gone for a little bit. comes back. They're all just, whoa, the cow, whoa, the cow, you know. And he gets mad. He throws out the Ten Commandments and then breaks them. And just, I mean, it's a big mess. And so for 40 years, he puts up with these people who just couldn't let it go. Kept hanging on to stuff. All right, so eventually... They get their acts together. And then he brings them to the promised land. And before they go into the promised land, Moses delivers what is the mother of all speeches, which you can read in the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is his entire final speech that he gave. That's a long speech. I don't know how long he's taken, but I'd be thinking, when is he going to shut up? You know, But it's a long, stinking speech. You've got to write the whole thing down. It's massive. You can read it. Go home. You have a hard time sleeping at night? Read that before you go to bed. 
Now this is amazing. This is from a man who at one point couldn't talk. Wasn't that he couldn't talk, he wouldn't talk. Why? Because his failures, he couldn't let it go. Eventually, he transforms again into this confident leader. And now when he talks, holy cow, can this guy talk? So he gives this incredible speech. And, uh, and then uh, he goes in the, up in the mountain, he dies, and God takes the children of Israel into the promised land. And uh, you can read the rest of it in your Bible. So here is this incredible figure, Moses, one of the greatest figures in the Bible and one of the greatest figures uh, in the history of mankind as agreed to by virtually everyone. This wasn't done in a secret. This man actually lived and did an incredible thing. It was Moses who gave us the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and the big old yo mama Deuteronomy. It was Moses who showed us the holiness of God as reflected in the law and the Ten Commandments. It was Moses who set an entire nation of slaves free and established them as one of the greatest nations this world has ever known. It was from this nation that Jesus came to us, the Messiah, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, all because of this man called Moses. Yet as great as Moses was, none of it would have been possible but for a single, bold, courageous, sacrificing, yet almost silent figure in history, his mom. And we read about it in Exodus, the first chapter. It says, then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. What's he talking about? Originally, the Jews came to Egypt because they followed Joseph. Joseph came and and the Pharaoh really loved Joseph and he made Joseph the most powerful man in Egypt and everything was great and they had great favor and their nations were growing like crazy and then a new king comes, doesn't care about Joseph or anything else. This king, this Pharaoh, hates the Jews. Okay, it's hundreds of years later. And in verse 9 he says, look, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. They're breeding like rabbits. And uh, so he says, come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us or leave, and leave the country, which they, they needed these people, this labor. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. In fact, much of the great uh, architecture of Egypt that you look at uh, was built by the Jews when they were slaves for like 430 years, whatever the number was. Uh, pretty impressive stuff here. Uh, but the reason they did this, the reason they got so harsh, particularly this Pharaoh, is he wanted to keep them from populating so much. I guess he figured if they worked him really hard, they wouldn't have the energy for you know what. So, this was the plan, work them too hard. But verse 12 says, the more they oppressed, the more they multiplied. <laughs> Apparently a man is never that tired. <laughs> I'm tired, but I'm not that tired. <laughs> well, they made their lives uh, bitter. They worked them ruthlessly, it says, verse, next verse. And they made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly, but they kept breeding like crazy. So the king of Egypt says, and he brings in the, the Hebrew midwives, these two ladies. I assume they were in charge of all the other midwives. Uh, Shifra and however you say that other name, I have no idea. And he says to them, look, when, when you're helping the Hebrew children during childbirth on the delivery stool, say, so what's that about? They actually would give birth on a stool to help the pressure kind of just out you go kind of deal. Very different today where women are laying down all drugged up, which I think is fabulous. I, I wanted drugs and I was just watching, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody give me something. Oh! Anyway, so <laughs> I don't know how you women do this. Oh my gosh. Anyway, uh, so I mean, very different. They, they would use these stools and they were very healthy ladies and blessed and they just out they came. So what he said is when you're giving childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see the baby as a boy, kill him. And I presume they meant, you know, secretly so they wouldn't know. And the job was just start knocking off all these boys to stop the population growth. If it's a girl, though, he says, let her live. 
Well, the midwives feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt told them to do, and they let the boys live. Well, when the king of Egypt summoned the midwives again, asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? They basically came up with a story. The way I read it, they're lying to Pharaoh. Uh, some Bible scholars think that there was actually truth to this. Uh, but the way it really comes across, he's, they're trying to deflect why they're not going to do this. And what they said is, look, the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. These women are vigorous. They give birth before we even show up. But by the time we get out there, out they came, you know. So there's nothing we can do. So apparently they're popping out like crazy. So God was kind to the midwives for not killing these boys. And the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. But then Pharaoh had had enough. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. But let every girl live. Now, they did this. We do not know how many boys were killed. But it had to be a substantial lot. And as, uh, whenever, of course, these people didn't have control of their own lives. They were slaves. And when they discovered the boys, the soldiers were to take them. And they just whipped them into the river. And they drowned and perished. Quite horrifying. Reminds me of Herod, who, when he heard Jesus was born, was so paranoid that a Messiah would come. He sent his soldiers in to kill every boy two years old and younger. Can you imagine the horror of this? They come breaking into your home. They grab your little boy. They drag him out and cut him in pieces. And don't tell you why. There was no why. There was no reason. They were just under orders. And they went and killed this horrifying thing the Egyptians did. Horrifying things that Herod did. But I have to tell you something. As awful as these men were, they are a mere shadow of the horror we have committed in our very own country. Over the last 30 years or so, we have murdered tens of millions of children, far higher than any number these guys even came close to touching. Apparently, the difference is they waited until they were born, we get them before they're born. It would appear as long as we can't hear the scream, we're okay with it. May God have mercy on our souls. Anyways, we continue on. Exodus, the second chapter. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And I'm sure their hearts were very disappointed. By this time, giving birth to a son was a horrifying thing. Because these men would come and take these little boys and whip them into the river and drown them. Uh, so here comes this boy. And while normally that would have been a thing of great joy, this was a moment of sorrow and great consternation. It's a boy. But when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she said, why couldn't you hide him any longer? Remember, they didn't have control of their lives. They were slaves. There were masters all around them. The minute they would find this child, see it was a boy, they would kill it. So in a moment of desperation, when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch so that it would float. And she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. She's not really even hiding him at this point. It's just an act of desperation. She knows she can't keep the child. She doesn't want him tossed into the river and murdered by these men. She floats him in this basket. I don't know if she knew what she was doing other than just the hand of God was directing her. But she just, for all she knew, he would die of hunger or exposure. She floats him out there in the river. Now the next verse says that Moses' sister, who undoubtedly is much older, she's probably 10, 12, maybe even older, we don't know. She's pretty sharp, we'll see in a minute. Um, she stood at a distance to see what would happen to Moses. Remember, they weren't hiding him. There was no plan. She floated him out in the weeds, and the sister's just kind of looking to see what's going to happen to this baby. Mom's probably bawling her eyes out. Who knows how horrible this is. But then amazingly, Pharaoh's daughter. Now, this is the daughter of the guy who's trying to kill all these boys. 
She goes down to the Nile to take a bath, and her attendants are walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds, sent one of her female slaves to go get it. She opened it and saw this little baby boy, and he was crying. And she felt sorry for him. And right away she knew who it was or where he came from. He said, this is one of the Hebrew babies. And she was enamored by this cute little boy as she's holding him, trying to comfort his crying. Well, the sister, sharp girl, comes running over. And she gathers around as these ladies are all fawning over this little boy. And uh, the sister says to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? And she says, yes, go. So the girl went and got the baby's mother, which was pretty cool. So here she comes and says, guess what? So the mother comes and Pharaoh's daughter says to the lady, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. Now there's a great gig, okay? So she gets the baby back and does what she wants to do and getting money now for it. But that wasn't the end of the story. As painful as the first separation was, she had to do it again. In verse 10 it says, when the child grew older, we don't know how old he was, I assume when he quit nursing, at some point she took this gorgeous little boy who she was undoubtedly in love with and loved her and took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son as she gave him up to her. And it was Pharaoh's daughter who named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. Thank God for moms. Moses' mom changed the history of the world by giving birth to and protecting that little boy. And here's the kicker. We don't even know her name. The Bible never even tells us her name. But for what she did, we would have not had this incredible man. Today, we celebrate moms. We praise you. We thank you for your sacrifice and all that you do. Sadly today, young women are praised if they don't become moms. If they get a college degree, we praise them. If they start a promising career, we praise them. If they gather as much of material possessions they can, we praise and celebrate them. In fact, we're so into it that we turn a blind eye if she has to murder her own children so that she can pursue those things which we value so highly in this country. It's sad. If a young woman chooses to marry and become a mother, it's as if our culture treats her with sadness, shame, even contempt if she thinks we think she's too young. Yet the single greatest contribution she is ever likely to make in her life will be to give new life and to see that life flourish and succeed. Make no mistake, folks, today, we are upside down in our values. And it is a sad thing to see. We need to get back to celebrating and encouraging life. Any woman's greatest contribution will be most likely the children she will give birth to. On her deathbed, her money will not comfort her. Her career will seem hollow and empty. The things she gathered will have been long forgotten. But the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren who surround her will be her greatest comfort and her greatest legacy. Today we celebrate moms, and we really celebrate the ones with a whole bunch of them, little rugrats. We're very big into big families in our celebration church culture. Uh, it's the most positive thing you can do is to bring up young people into the fear and admiration of the Lord and let them loose in a world. We have a great saying in Celebration Church. It's outbreed the pagans. 
Today we thank God for these incredible women who give so much of themselves, for these women who endure the pain of childbirth so they can experience the immeasurable joy of motherhood. For these women who do with less so that others may have more. We thank God for these women who choose to give us the greatest gift of all, the gift of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that we honor these women who do this incredible thing. Thank you for this woman we just read about, even though we don't know her name, the mother of Moses, who did an incredible thing and helped change the world in which we live. Lord, today as we celebrate these women, may our moms feel loved, cherished, appreciated. Thank you, God, for all that they do and for who they are. May this day they know that they are indeed loved and appreciated. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.